Well, good morning, Word of Life Church. How are you doing this morning? You look good. You doing good? Well, uh, it's an honor to be here with you this morning. My name is Tyler. I'm the children's pastor here at the Lakeland campus. And uh, it's an honor just to be able to speak with you for a few minutes this morning. Um, I wanted to start off, though, uh, with a word of prayer. So we can just bow our heads and just give this over to God because I believe he has some things that he wants to say this morning. Father, we just thank you that you are here, God. Um, and as we've just saying, you are great. We thank you, Father, that those aren't just words, but they're truth. Uh, they're promises from you. And we thank you, Father, for your faithfulness, uh, that a season doesn't determine your goodness, Father, but you are always good. And I thank you, Father, for these next few moments that as we uh, sit, as we hear, as I speak, God, that everything else fade away and your voice be the realest thing to us, Father. I thank you that no time with you can someone experience you and leave it the same. So, Father, I thank you that uh, after this time together, we leave change, that you speak to us, have your way. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you believe that, say amen. So, I, I was wondering, I was just thinking about just things that happened in my life, and I was wondering, I want to get to know you a little bit better this morning, is um, have you ever found yourself in a situation where you had this thought, this is not what I signed up for? Maybe somebody told you about a movie, and you went to the movie, and like halfway through the movie, and after paying $9 for a ticket and $15 for popcorn, you were like, this is not it. Or maybe somebody bragged about a restaurant that was their favorite restaurant, right? And so you go and you try it out, and the food is just not hitting the spot. Maybe you've been there before. Now, I can remember a few times where this happened to me, but the first time it happened, I was seven years old. Right? Seven years old, I had the world figured out. I'm kidding. I was a kid. I loved Power Rangers. That was it. Seven years old, I found myself in, in this situation of, uh, this isn't what I signed up for. And it started with two words. Maybe you've heard these two words before. Maybe not. But the two words were, fun, run. Can anyone guess why I was down for the fun run when I was seven years old? It's that first word, right, fun. When you, when you try to top fun into anything with a the kid, they're, they're automatically down, right? It's going to be fun. They're like, oh, yeah, I'm signed up for fun, right? Seven years old, and my mom approaches me, and she's like, hey, my, uh, my job is sponsoring this 5K, and then there's also a fun run for kids. So I'm like, yeah, sure, I'm down. Fun run, right? I'm always up for some fun. And so... A few days go by, and then the Saturday morning of the fun run starts. And as, as it's approaching, I'm thinking, is it like a, a big game of tag, right? Is it like an Easter egg hunt, but like you, you just have fun while you do it? I have no idea. And so the morning comes, I've, I've had my cereal, had my Cinnamon Toast Crunch, had, I'm drinking a Coke, right? She's like, hey, you might not want to be doing that on the way to this fun run. I'm like, mom, chill, I'm seven. It's, it's, it's my super fuel, right? And so we're riding uh, on our way to the fun run. I'm still trying to think, what is a fun run? We finally get there, and, and I realize, right, I put some pieces together, and I realize that it's a race. I'm like, oh, it's a race, right? Seven-year-olds, every seven-year-old thinks they're the fastest kid in the world. So I'm seven years old, I'm like, I'm fast, right? Nobody can beat me. Whenever, whenever we race to the playground, right, I'm always the first one there. We race to the slide. We race all the time. So I'm like, what's another race? And on top of that, it's called a fun run. It's going to be exciting. It's going to be awesome. It's going to be the best thing ever. So they corral like 40 kids into this starting gate, which is, sounds dangerous and scary to most of you, but I'm a children's pastor. That sounds amazing. 40 kids corralling this gate, and they're getting ready to start us off. So the ref, he shoots the gun, and we take off. I mean, I'm in the front and I'm running with everything that I have because no one is going to beat me in this fun run. I'm running with everything that I got and I'm out in front and I'm doing great and it's amazing. It's the best feeling ever. I of the Tiger was playing in the background or at least I thought it was. I was just, I was having a great time. I'm running and all of a sudden something hits me and I'm like, wait, something's not right. Where's the swing set? Where, where's the slide we're supposed to be running to? And as I'm running fast, I start to slow down, and everybody else just kind of starts to catch up with me. I'm like, wait a minute. Something's not right. I'm hurting on the inside. Uh, not the Holy Spirit. It's just my stomach. I'm feeling that Coke from earlier. I think my arm's going numb. I'm worried. I'm, I'm scared. I'm like, I can't give up now, and kids are passing me. And I realize that fun run is not just like a, a quick run. It's, it's a mile run. And to a seven-year-old who just had cereal and a can of Coke, maybe two cans of Coke and some candy, this is not the best mixture. 
And so I'm running, I've gone from running to jogging to like this limp thing, and I don't even know where it was coming from because I didn't fall. I just started limping. I was like, maybe somebody will feel sorry for this seven-year-old and tell him to like stop or give me a ride back to where the finish line was. But y'all, the race, it was at out half a mile and back half a mile. And that may not seem like a far distance to, to my runners out there, if you are, but to a seven-year-old who just had two cans of Coke, a bowl of Cinnamon Toast Crunch, and a, and a bunch of candy, it was forever. And so I go to this, from this limp, this limp thing to, to trying to muster up strength so that when I feel like the, fin the people at the finish line can see me, I decide, you know what, I'm going to try to run so maybe they'll think I ran the whole time. And it was the most pitiful thing, y'all. Like, as soon as I felt like they could see me, I tried to get speed. But when you're, you're speeding up with a limp, it doesn't look good. They just, they're like, come on, you can do it. And, and when I got back, when I finally made it, right, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to hold back tears, right, trying to keep it together. I'm like, I'm done. I don't ever want to run again. Never. I'm not even going to run to the TV, right? I'm going to walk. So I'm done running. And in that moment, I was like, this is not what I signed up for. I was exhausted. Have you ever found yourself exhausted? Maybe not from a run, right? But maybe emotionally exhausted. Maybe, maybe you're, as I said exhausted, I feel like some of you were thinking 2020, right? Maybe your 2020 looked like my fun run. Like you started off good, right? It's going to be fun. It's going to be a fun run. It's going to be great. You got your calendar. You got your goals. You got your planner with your stickers. You got your trips planned out, right? Your vacations planned. But then, like, and January was good. February was even better, right? We're moving on. 2020 is going to be the best year ever. And then March hit. And March was like, hold up. Wait a second. And then here comes April and May. And you are at, like, a screeching halt. And then you find yourself in June and now July. And it was like, can we just hit fast forward? Like, this is not what I signed up for. How many of you guys would agree that, that this 2020 would not be what you have signed up for? Can I see you raise your hands? Okay. All right. So we find ourselves like exhausted or we find ourselves just done. Have you ever been done before? Maybe you're like, I'm done right now. I came in done. It's okay. We've all been there. I, I find myself done on 2.30 on, on a Monday, right? Anybody love Mondays? So on a Monday at 2.30, I'm at, uh, at the bank drive-thru, and I'm there because uh, me and my wife, we, just, we just, uh, just recently got to get another house. But in order to do that, we had to go through some steps to get the house. You got to sell the house you have to get the house you want. So I'm in the drive-thru of a, of a bank, and I'm getting a cashier's check. So I'm on the phone with her trying to get the amount right because you don't want to mess that up. So I'm trying to get the amount right, and as, uh, as I'm on the phone with her, uh, the teller, you know, they pop up on the screen, hey, how can I help you today? I'm like, hey, how you doing? I just need a cashier check. She's like, okay, it'll be a fee of $10. So I'm like, all right, $10, right? We have $10. And so as I'm going to tell my wife, I'm like, hey, love, uh, it's going to be $10 from the other side of the phone. What? $10? Oh, my gosh. Why is it that much? That, that's crazy. And, y'all, I was done, right? I was, I was tired. It's 2.30 in the afternoon when that lull hits, you know, where it's like you got to try to fight to keep your eyes open. And I was like, I said this in love. Okay, I felt like I have to preface that. But I said, hey, love, um, you're reacting right now. I need you to respond. Like, we got the money. Can we just, just pay it and, and get the goal and get what we wanted to and get where we want to go? And at that moment, this hand reached through the phone and it grabbed my throat. It didn't. <laughs> I promise. I'm good. I'm good. And I said it in love, but I, I was like, we got the money, right? We, we got the money. We can, uh, we can, we can get this check and, and be in the new house. And so as, I'm, as I get off the phone with her, I'm like, hmm, okay, man, she reacted when she could have just responded. I'm like, wow, that's a message. I'm going to use that as an example one day. It's going to be great. And as I'm pulling out of the drive-thru of the bank, God kind of nudges me. He's like, so if it's not okay for her to do that, then why do you do that? I was like, mm, you got me. Let's look at Luke <laughs> chapter 8. Go ahead and turn to Luke chapter 8. And while you're turning, I, 
I'd love some response. Have you ever reacted before? Maybe, maybe that's been you. Maybe it wasn't at a bank. Maybe it was, uh, maybe you saw like a spider and you reacted to it. Um, husbands, maybe your wife called you to come kill something that she saw and reacted to, like a roach or a spider, things like that. Um, maybe somebody was rude to you. And maybe somebody was petty to you. And you decided, you know what, I'm going to react and let them know that they were being rude to me. Or maybe they were being petty to you. And you're like, you know what? I'll see you're petty, and I will raise you petty. Maybe that's been you. We've all done it before. My favorite recently happened, uh, parents with your kids, when they, were, when they were just getting able to walk, right? And they're kind of clumsy, so they're doing this, this wobble thing right here, and they fall. What do they do? They look up at you like, what's the reaction going to be? And if you, if you do it the wrong way, you're going to have some tears. But you got you to gotta flip it, right? It's like, hey, oh, you're okay, right? Safe, you know, good job. And based upon your reaction, they'll react. Everybody say react. We all react. So we're going to look at Luke chapter 8, verses 22. And in this story, maybe you're familiar with it before. Maybe you've heard it for the first time. Either way, I pray that we get something out of it, which we are, because God's word is living and powerful. So in Luke chapter 8, verse 22, you have Jesus, and he's with his group, his squad, the disciples. He's with his disciples. They've just gotten, he's just gotten done ministering, but then Jesus says in verse 22, it says, his disciples got into a boat, and he said to them, let us go to the other side of the lake. So they launched out. But as they were sailing along, Jesus fell asleep. And after he fell asleep, a fierce gale of wind descended on the lake, and they began to be swamped and be in danger. So everything's cool, right? We just got done with the meeting. They jump in the boat. They're going. And then all of a sudden, they find themselves in the middle of this storm. And there are these six-foot waves that are pouring into the boat. The wind's thrashing this boat back and forth because it wasn't a really big boat. And the disciples are freaking out. Verse 24 says, they came to Jesus and woke him up, right? And as I'm sitting there, I like to, like, take, I like to put myself in the story and see, like, if I was scared for my life, how would I wake Jesus up? So I don't think, I really don't think that the disciples were like, you know, hey, hey, Jesus, hey, 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 Jesus, um, I don't mean to bother you, but could you help us with this? No, the disciples were in fear of their life. First of all, I believe they had an argument to see who was going to have to be the one to wake Jesus. Because I don't know if I wanted to be in the, written down in history as the one who woke Jesus, right? So finally, after one of them lost, they went over, and they said, Jesus, you know, they shook him, shook him really hard. Nobody, know, nobody likes being woken up, being shaken like that, but they wake him up, and they, they say to him in verse 24, Master, Master, we are perishing. We're about to die. And he got up, and he rebuked the storm. He rebuked the wind. He rebuked the waves. He said, Peace be still, and everything was calm. But get this, then he looks at the disciples in verse 25, and he says to them, where is your faith? He says, guys, where, where's your faith? Now, in that moment, the, the disciples were reacting, right? There's, there's a storm. Uh, we're scared. And they were reacting out of emotion. But in this same moment, Jesus, he responds, he doesn't just respond with like an answer. He responds in faith. And we see his response change the entire situation. And then he looks at the disciples and he says, where's your faith? And it's amazing not only that, yes, Jesus, he calmed the storm, right? He, he moved in faith and his response calmed this amazing storm. But looking at the life of Jesus, he always had a response, I'm, I'm looking at, I'm, I'm, I'm reading like some of the miracles of Jesus, and I don't know what I would have done in certain situations that, that Jesus was faced with. I mean, there was one time where Peter came to him and said, hey, man, my mother-in-law's sick. I need you to lay your hands on her, I think. I need you to lay your hands on her so she can be healed, right? Jesus comes in, fever leaves. There's another opportunity where Jesus is in the middle of preaching to a huge crowd, right? Packed out house, no room left, sold out. He's jumping into his message, and all of a sudden, the ceiling starts to get peeled back. And, and everybody's attention goes to this hole in the ceiling as it's being lowered down, as this man is being lowered down on this put-together cot by his friends who are looking through the hole. And this man gets lowered down in the middle of this meeting. And Jesus has a response. 
What's his response? Get up. In the midst of that, he's being judged by officials who are judging his miracle, and he also has a response for them. Jesus always had a response. I'm amazed that when, when he arrived on shore to a place, the crowds were already ready. They were waiting on the shore for him, like, you know, is he going to come this way? You know, not leaving any room for him to walk, but they were waiting on the shore for him. Jesus is on his way. He's met by a man who says, hey, Jesus, my daughter, she's on her deathbed. You got to come now. Like, you got to be there now. I'm on the phone with people, and they're telling me, like, she's, she's not breathing, but I, I told them you were coming, and, and Jesus, I need you to be there. So Jesus is like, all right, let's go. We out. Let's go. And so Jesus is on his way and is stopped by a woman who's terminally ill, and he has a response for her. But then get this, that man, Jairus, gets a call, his servant. Hey, Jairus, I'm sorry, man. It's over. Uh, she's, she's moved on. But Jesus has the right response in that moment to be able to speak and say, hey, no, -uh, we're going. We're still going. He always had a response. And he shows up. Uh, if you're familiar with that story, he shows up, and, and Jesus like, hey, she's going to live. And they laugh at him. And Jesus has a response for them. You know what his response was? Get out. He moved them all out, told the girl to get up, and she's healed. He always had a response. It's amazing, no matter what the situation, no matter how many people he had already ministered to, no matter what came at him, whether it was physical, whether it was spiritual, he always had a response. And people brought him the, 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 uh, the sick, people brought him the blind, people, he, he had to show up and, and raise a dear friend from the dead. There were people who were watching him, and he had, he had the response to say, hey, Lazarus, come forth, and know that the power of God was going to go and bring his friend back to life. And how amazing is it for the, for the disciples to be able to have a front row seat to this and know who they're, who, they're, who they're moving with, who they're rolling with. But then Jesus does something else. Because Jesus said, hey, guys, this is not just for me. And I want to turn this scripture in Luke. Let's check this out. Ah, stuck note, sorry. Luke chapter 9, verses 1 and 2. In Luke chapter 9, verse 1 and 2, Jesus totally changes the game. He says, he called his 12 disciples together. He gave them the power and authority over all devils. Really quick, I need you to get some participation out of you. You need some help. It says that he called his 12 disciples together and he gave them, what's that word? I'm sorry, what's that word? Children's pastor, okay. And what's the other word? Okay, so we got two words. He gave them power and authority over, thank you, all devils and to cure diseases. We got different translations. It's okay. All right. And he sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. John 14, 12, it says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do, he do also. And greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. So Jesus was telling them, look. So, guys, the things that you've seen me do, like when we were, remember we were on the shore? Remember we were in the boat, better yet, and you woke me up, and I got up and rebuked the storm? Or remember when we got to the, got to, landed on the shore, and the crowd mobbed us, but the lady, she touched my, my clothes, and she was healed because the power of God came out of me? Or remember when we showed up at the house, and they were sick, and I healed them? Remember all that stuff, guys? Guess what? You guys are going to do that. It's no longer just me, but you guys are going to have the power and the authority to do that. It's on you. Shortly before Jesus goes back to heaven, he, he leaves them with this too. I love this one. John 16, 13, it says, How be it, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you in all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. Jesus told his disciples, hey, everything that I have, Everything that you've seen me move in, the power, the authority, the being able to know, it's not only I who am I going to be able to do that. To be, I'm not the only one who's going to be able to respond and give the right response. Now it's you, you guys will have the ability to do that. You guys will have the knowing. You guys will have the same spirit of power that I had, the same authority that I have. You will have that. And if we have the same power and the same authority that Jesus had, we have the same Holy Spirit. That Jesus had to where he was able to move and know exactly what to do and exactly how to respond, then my question is, why don't we? Why do we choose to react rather than 
respond in faith and see the situation change? Well, just being real, when it comes to choosing to react, is, it's easy. Reaction, reacting to something, oh, man, oh, that's so unfair. Like reacting to something, it's, it's easy to do because it requires no effort. It, it even allows us to shift the blame. That's not my fault. It just happens to me. It's easy to do. Another reason we may react is because we don't know any better. We don't know that there's more to this. Maybe you're new to the faith. Maybe you're new to following Jesus and you don't know. Hey, it's not just being saved, but it's being set free. It's being empowered to go out and not only be affected by the gospel, but to go and preach the gospel. And, and, it's, and it happens because we don't take the time to, like, check the manual. So really, really quick, raise your hands. How many of you know what an iPhone manual looks like? No hands. Oh, one, one, okay. All right. One hand, okay. I can be honest and tell you that I have no idea what the inside of an iPhone manual looks like. You know why? Because me, like most of you probably, when you get the new phone, you just take the phone out, you pick up the manual, and then you throw it to the side because the charger and the headphones are right there, right? That expensive charging cable. And we use it for basic features, right? We use it for, for calling, texting, download a few apps, and then we're good. But there are so many features that this iPhone has that we could benefit from if we would only just take the time to read the manual. If we would only just take the time to learn the features. Because we know that the manual is designed by the maker. And if we don't consult the, the, the manual, then we're going to miss out on things that the maker intended for us to benefit from. We've got to read the manual. So, so with that, it's like we, 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 don't, like we don't know. It's easy to react. We don't know. Or we just simply choose not to respond. You know, I could respond. I'm just going to. I'm just going to be a victim. I'm just going to re react to this because it feels, like I said, easy to do. But there's, there's a danger that comes when we choose to react, and that's our only option. There's a danger that comes when we settle with, with reacting to situations and reacting to life and reacting to things that happen to us rather than responding to them. And this is the danger. If we choose to live our life reacting to the things that happen to us, things that are attacking us and our family, we will, we will spend our life accepting those things. When the whole while, God paid the price for us to have dominion over those things. Because we can't, I can't sit here and, and tell you that we don't have an enemy. We do have an enemy who whose sole purpose is to keep you from everything that God has freely given you. Let's look at 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8 and 9. Everybody say respond. Love it. So in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8 and 9, Jesus warns, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. But the God of all grace, who hath called us into his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that ye have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. I like the message translation. It says, keep a cool head, stay alert. The devil is poised to pounce and would like nothing better than to catch you napping. Keep your guard up. You're not the only ones plunged into these hard times. It's the same with Christians all over the world. So keep a firm grip on the faith. The suffering won't last forever. It won't be long before this generous God who has great plans for us in Christ, eternal and glorious plans they are, will have you put together and on your feet for good. He gets the last word. Yes, he does. He gets the last word. So this... This reacting and this responding came out of a conversation I had with a friend who, who was affected by, corona, by this epidemic, by the things, by this tension that we have, and he was hurt by it. And it was one of those moments, maybe you've had this conversation like this before, where like, 
the best ministry you could provide in this conversation was just listening and hearing what they had to say. And his, and his main argument was, well, well, God's in control, right? Well, God's in control. Why is, why is all, God's in control. Why is all this stuff happening? And I, part of you is like, ah, you know, but this is what, this is my heart for him. And this is my heart for us to know is, is that Ephesians 6, 12 puts it perfectly. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and against powers. Notice it says we. It doesn't just say God, but, but we. And so we have the authority and we have the power. But we wrestle not against flesh and blood. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Our battle is not with people. Our battle is not against flesh and blood. But we have an enemy out there, and the things that we see going on in our world, the things that we see scrolling on the news, the things that we see in social media, the things that we see that are attacking our families, all these things that are happening, we're allowing it. I say we're allowing it. You know why? Because we've, given the, we've been given the authority and the power by Jesus. He told us that, right? He, Luke chapter 9, he told us that he's given us the authority and the power to be able to respond to this rather than, be, to, rather than to react to the situation. So get this, the enemy knows that if we don't know who we are, he can continue to do what he does. And we can only walk in the degree of freedom that we have a revelation of. Let me break that down. So if, if you don't know you're an overcomer, you can be overcome. If you don't know that, that Christ has always caused you to triumph, he causes you to triumph all the time. If you don't know that, then you play the victim. But you are more than a conqueror. You are an overcomer. You can be faced with storms and not be shaken. But we got to know who we are. How do, how do, we, how do we do that? we got to consult the manual. Now, when we know who we are, though, we can respond. When we know who we are, we can see situations change. When we know who we are, just like in uh, 1 Peter chapter 5, we can keep a firm grip on the faith. Maybe uh, yesterday before it started raining, you got to swim just a little bit. <laughs> and I can remember swimming as a kid uh, at my parents' house. But number one rule of swimming in this pool was you always check the skimmer. Now, the skimmer is the thing that just takes the, the trash out of the pool. But sometimes, like critters and stuff, it likes to live or find their way into the skimmer. Sometimes frogs, sometimes snakes. And on this particular day, I went to check the skimmer, and I'm looking at a snake, right? First of all, some of you guys are like, nope, you said snake. So I'm looking, and I'm looking at a snake. I'm not looking at any old snake. I'm looking at a water moccasin. It's a big note, right? <laughs> and so I have a decision to make, right? I'm like, I can go get the net. I can just, you know, get him out and then, like, let him go on his way. Or option two is I, I can deal with it. I can respond. So I get the net, and I pick him up. And I have him right there on the side of the pool. And I look over and I got a flathead shovel. I got my authority sitting over there. <laughs> I get a flathead shovel. I'm like, today's the day. Not today, Satan. Today's the day. So I try to time it just right. I get the net ready. Because when he, I'm like, I'm not going to let him go. I got to get him right now. So, so I, I, I'm trying to figure out what's the best like, way to take my authority. And so... I have this shovel, and so I figured, I resolved that holding it overhead and just bringing the, bringing the wrath of God down on this snake is going to help. Like, so I get it ready, and I rear back, and I bring that shovel down with everything I got within me. And I missed. I missed. I was just shaking so bad. But I, I tried again, and I got him the second time, okay? I used my authority and got rid of him. <laughs> But when you know who you are, you're able to respond in faith. You're able to see the situation change rather than be shaken by the situation. No matter what it is, the same way that Jesus was faced with, with, with task after situation, after problem, after, after healing, he was able to, to know and respond to those things. And that's the same way with us. 
But how do we do it? How do we know? How do we, how do we have that response? Well, first, you just look at the life of Jesus. You look at the life of Jesus and there's a constant. You see that he's always Always, whether it's with his disciples or uh, in between ministry, there's something that Jesus always did. He'd always take time to separate himself and get before the Father. He would always take time to get face to face with his Father. Whether it was a mountainside or it's, sometimes it says he'd be away in a place. Before, before, he, would, before he chose his disciples, after he fed the 5,000, he found him with his Father. One particular time, he came back. The disciples were like, hey, uh, Jesus, me and the guys were talking, and, like, you're always, you're, you're always just, like, going off. And so, uh, like, you told us before, we prayed together. Uh, could you just kind of, like, teach us how to do that? And so Jesus tells them, hey, when, I'm, when, I'm, when I go off to pray, pray in this way, right? Luke chapter 11 and verse 3, it says, give us this day our daily bread. What I believe Jesus was trying to say was, look, hey, God knows what's coming. And when I consult him, he gives me everything I need for that day. He gives me everything that I need for any situation that tries to come up, and I'm going to have the response for it. I'm going to have the flathead shovel for any snake that tries to come up. And you can too. It's like, what was Jesus doing, right? Was he, he wasn't looking on his Bible app, right? What was Jesus doing? He was getting before the Father. He was getting before his maker, and he was letting the father confirm who he was. He was letting the father reaffirm and let him know, hey, I'm with you. I'm for you. And he was talking to the father. And it is so awesome to know that we have that same access. Jesus, Jesus told his disciples, he was teaching this parable, and I feel like it, it it captures perfectly what he was doing but, and also what he wanted them to do, the, the, the plan, the, his desires, his heart form. And it's, it's uh, the parable of the wise and the foolish builder. I'm going to share it with you really quick in Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7, verses 24 through 29. We're going to look at it. And I feel like this is Jesus' heart for, for us in and, and this season where we feel exhausted. I feel like... It's such a great word for us to take heed to. Um, In Matthew chapter 7, it says, Therefore, whoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man who built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon the rock. Then it goes on to say, and everyone that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not shall be likened unto a foolish man, which built his house upon the sand, and the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell. And it was a great, and great was the fall of it. And so as I was reading this story, it's like the, the only difference in this story was, was the foundation. The wise man, although he was wise, he still faced the storm. He just had the right response. The foolish man faced the same storm, but he reacted, right? It all crashed. And so as I'm looking at this, I'm like, okay, what does this mean? And, and before the storm even came, right, before the rain even descended, before the winds blew, before the, the, the rivers rose, and before the house was even being beat on, in verse 24 it says, I will liken him unto a wise man which built. Verse 26 says, I will liken him unto a foolish man which built. That shows me that there was time before the storm came. And and my heart is this, is that we wouldn't overlook that because that makes the difference. What are we going to do with the time that we have? Jesus took time to get full. Jesus, if I could phrase it this way, he, he led so he wouldn't have to react. He said, you know what? Storms are coming. I think we could all agree that we've faced some storms this past few weeks and these past few months. Maybe you came in this morning. Maybe you are right now battling with a storm. Storms come. They do, and they will always come on this side of heaven. But we can know what to do. We can have a response. 
We don't have to react. We can respond in faith. We don't have to be victims. It's, it's funny that as we read this story, we observe that clearly there was a difference. Clearly one stayed standing and one fell. And how many know in the life of a believer, as, as children of God as we are, as followers of Jesus, that there should be a difference in the way our life looks in a storm and how everyone else's life looks. Amen? There, there should be a power at work. There should be a foundation at work in our life that people notice because we're children of God. And, and now more than ever, not only should we have a response, we should be the response. Because we can, because we've been given the power and the authority to take a stand, to see something happening on the news and be like, no, it's not going to be that way. Or, or hear news and not be shaken. And, and that will get people's attention. And that may open a conversation for faith. But you can be full. We just got to take the time. You can know and have a response for any situation. You just got to take the time. In praying for this message, it was just two words. The guy was just speaking to my heart, and it wasn't fun running. <laughs> it was slow down. You think God didn't see all this stuff coming? But the beautiful thing about that is there's grace, there's power that he had already set aside. There's, there's direction, there's wisdom that he already sets aside for us to walk in. So that when that storm comes, because storms are going to come, we can walk through, we can steal, we can stay standing. But it's your choice. God can't choose for you. You have to choose to know who you are, know your authority, and respond in faith rather than to react out of emotion because God can't back reaction. He's not moved by our tears. He's not moved by emotion. What does move God, though? It's the same thing that pleases God. Faith. Faith requires action. What's that action? It's a response. Regardless of what this looks like, regardless of what facts tell me, this is my response. Because the cool thing about authority is when you move in your authority, authority is only as strong as the power behind it, right? Your siblings, mom said clean the room. You're like, maybe I will, maybe I won't. Then mom shows up. You're like, I'm going to clean this room. You have a police officer directing traffic. He holds his hand out. And the car stops, not because the police officer is Superman, but because the government is backing the police officer. So when you're faced with a storm, and rather than be shaken by it, rather than react, and you speak to those principalities and powers, and you tell it to stop, guess who's backing you up? I say, guess who's backing you up? You got all of heaven backing you up. And when you know that, when you have a, re a revelation of that, you have no choice but to respond and see the situation change. But it's your choice. You can react or respond. You can know what to do. You will move through this season and not be shaken. I believe 2020, the rest of it will be the best of it because you know who you are. You're done playing the victim. But we gotta take the time to get full. Let me pray over you this morning. Father, we just thank you for this time together. God, I thank you that you hide no part of yourself from us. And as we take time to get before you, God, you tell us who we are. I thank you, Father, for peace and rest over these precious people. Thank you, Father, that you fill us up. That when we draw near to you, you fill us up we draw near to you, you draw near to us and give us everything that we need. And God, I just thank you that you just give them the greater revelation of who you are to them and who they are. Uh, if you're here this morning and you never made a decision for Jesus, uh, I just want to ask you to repeat after me because it starts with Jesus.
I want to say, dear God, thank you for your love for me. I believe you sent Jesus to pay the price for me. I choose to follow you. I choose to live for you. I choose to, to respond in faith and not react. I will walk in my authority. I will see the situation change. And I won't be shaken by the storm, but I'll steal the storm. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to thank you guys so much for being here this morning. If you made a decision for Jesus, maybe that was your first time praying that prayer. That's the best decision you could have ever made. And we want to help you. We want to walk with you. For us to do that, you got to do something for us. You got to text the word decision to 313131. Maybe, maybe you've already made a decision. Maybe you just need prayer. Maybe like, I'm still a little exhausted. I need somebody to walk with me. We got you. Just text decision to 313131. And there's a spot there for you to put your prayer requests. It's a great guy who receives those prayer requests. I guarantee you he's going to pray over you and give you whatever resources you need to, re to respond and not react. Thank you guys so much for being here this morning. We love you. Have a great week.